Well, good morning. I am uh, glad to be with you this morning. I am glad that you are here. I want to thank Kenan for teaching last Sunday this class. I enjoyed it uh, so much. I was thinking about him teaching for me this morning. Um, but we are here together, so I am excited about that. We are turning to 1 Timothy chapter 5 this morning. Matt has been, he taught most of chapter 4, maybe all of chapter 4, which was really the qualifications for ministry. And now, Paul turns in chapter 5 to the topic of Christian relationships and responsibility in the local church. So let me, let me start us off with a prayer, and then we will dive right in. Dear Heavenly Father, it is um, a joy to be back in your word. I pray, Lord, that you would lead, that your word would go out in power, that you would lead to the Spirit. I pray, Lord, that these, these words that really teach us how we are to interact with each other, um, Lord, I, I pray that they would sink deep into our hearts and that it would be something that we desire to do and you give us the ability through the Spirit to do. Lord, we are your people because you have made us your people. And so, Lord, we thank you. And um, we desire to, to, to live in light of what you have done for us. Bless this class, bless Ken as he, bless all the teachers in this hour, in all the classes, and I pray that you would bless Kent and strengthen him again as he teaches in about an hour. We ask these things in Christ's name, amen. So we are in 1 Timothy chapter 5, and I want to remind you that the theme of this book is what we've gone to multiple times. It's 1 Timothy 3.15, and it's where Paul writes to Timothy, but in case I, Paul, am delayed, I write so that you, will, that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the house of, household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar in support of the truth. This is Paul's instruction for the church, for individuals of the church, us that make up the local body, and more specifically, what relation, our relationships as believers should be with each other. And so, we are related, and we are related, and I, we, we often, this week, many notes, many kind notes, emails, you get, the, you get the greeting brother, we talk to each other as if we're brothers and sisters, we use that term in the church, and, and, and so I think just as a very basic review, how are we related? when we use those terms. In, in what is, what, how are we related to each other if we're going to use the terms brothers and sisters? Well, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We, we, are, we are related because of our individual relationships that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone who is in Christ has the Spirit of Christ residing in them, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so all believers have the same Spirit. Thus, all believers are united in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are, we are united in Him and said specifically, He is the tie that binds us together. We are a spiritual family because of that, and we are to act as a spiritual family, okay? Second, how are we to act with each other if we are bound together in Christ? Again, we're in the church. Paul is telling us how we should act inside the church. He's instructing us. How, how do we behave toward each other? So, if you're in 1 Timothy, hold your finger there. I want to go to a, a few of... Paul's other words that are ringing in my ears. 1 Corinthians, 10, uh, 1 Corinthians 1. 1 
1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Paul writes, Now I exhort you, brethren, there's that term, brothers in Christ, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there is no divisions among you, but that you may be complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Okay? Go forward to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Paul writes this over and over and over again. He says, only conduct yourselves in a worthy manner of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We all have families, I hope. Many of our families have an element of dysfunction. You're probably aware of that. You probably live that. But the desire and the beautiful part of the family is when everybody's on the same page. And as a church and as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and united with him, we should be of the mind, same mindset. We should have the same goal. The Lord has saved us for a purpose, and that purpose is the building of his kingdom. We should be trying to build with blocks that are spiritual. That should be the same goal that all of us have. He's used the word gospel here twice. We, we, we need to be together proclaiming the gospel. Go to chapter, if you're in Philippians, Go to chapter 2. He's going to continue this theme. Ultimately, he's going to get to the Lord Jesus Christ. But look at verse 3. How are we to act towards one another? How are we, if we're related in Christ, how are we to be united with each other? He gets into the nitty-gritty here. Verse 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. This is how we should live in relationship because of the relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his bond servants. The relationship that you and I have together is of fellow bond servants. We're all on the master's estate, and we're not the master. And it is so easy to say these words, to think these words, and at the same time, it is so difficult to put these words in practice. There is... There is a struggle that each one of us faces where it's hard for us to get beyond ourselves. We naturally, what we were born into, our sin nature, we have this lens that we're born with that it's all about me and the world revolves around me. We often think of ourselves as the hero of our own story but we're not. We're not. And it's only when we get beyond ourselves and realize it's not about us, but it's about him, the Lord Jesus Christ, that's when we're going to be united. That, that's when we're going to have a unity. That's when we're going to behave like we should in the church. We are to be humble. We are to be selfless. We are to realize that it is not about us. Go to Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to flip before we really dive in. Go to Matthew 20. This is the last verse. In Matthew 20, the mother of James and John come to the Lord Jesus Christ with a very selfish request 
for her sons, a self-seeking request about them sitting at his right hand and his left hand. And in the response, Jesus talks about the Gentiles lording over them, which is verse 25, Matthew 20, verse 25. And then he gets to verse 26. And again, he reminds us of how we are to act towards one another. Verse 26, it is not this way among you, Jesus says, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And with that in mind, I want to turn and go back to 1 Timothy chapter 5. I think that it sets the table for what we want to look at in these verses. We're going to try to get through the first eight verses today and to get all the way through verse 16 next Sunday. That's the plan. So 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. Follow along as I read these verses out loud. Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father, to the younger man as brothers, and older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are widows indeed. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. Now she who is a widow indeed and who has been left alone has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. But she who has given herself to wanton pleasure is dead while she lives. Prescribe these things as well, well, so that they may be above reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Broken this, this section, just this, these eight verses just into two sections. The first section is the first two verses. It is Christian correction. These verses presuppose that there is error and that these four different categories are being corrected. And how do you approach these that are being corrected? Verse 1, do not sharply re- rebuke an older man. That's the, that's the first category, the older man. We all get off track. We all at times need help getting back on track. If you are married, I'm sure your spouse will help you at times get back on track. We need correction. This applies to all of us. And so this first group, older men, the word in the Greek is presbyteros. It's the same word that later in this chapter, in verses 17 and beyond, replied, uh, in, uh, apply to an elder. It's translated as an elder. Here it's not an elder, it's not an office. You're talking about older men here, okay? Paul says to Timothy, Timothy Jung, and, and, and really the instruction is for all of us. Again, how do, we, how do we function together as a body together with each other? And so it, it applies to all of us. Do not sharply rebuke an older man. You are not to beat on an older man with your words, you are not to chastise him. That is not how you are to approach. Instead, you are to encourage him. You are to appeal to him. This word for appealing means to come alongside. It's the same root word that is in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that comes alongside. He's the parakletos. He comes alongside to help. That is, how, that is the Spirit in which you are to approach an older man. I think of my father when I read these verses. 
my father is, is no longer with us. And he was um, not a perfect man by any stretch of the imagination. But I loved him. And I respected him as my father. He was wrong about many things in his life. And when I had to go to him, I appealed to him with the respect and dignity that he deserved. I, know, I, I, w I wouldn't have ever have even thought of rebuking him or approaching him or trying to get him to change what he was doing by, by rebuking him. I came with, to him with respect. He got sick. He didn't make the right choice. And I literally begged him at a point in time with tears. And, it, and, it, and he accepted the counsel. And that's how we are to treat older men when they need to be corrected, with respect and dignity. You treat them as you would treat your father. This is not a confrontational relationship. This is a relationship built upon respect. The Bible makes this clear. You don't have to turn there. You might write this down. It's Leviticus 19.32, uh, you shall rise up before the gray-headed, the old, and honor the aged, and you shall revere your God, I am the Lord. The next in the category, actually, let's, let's turn to one more verse there, Go to because it applies both to the men and the women. Go to Proverbs chapter 23. Chapter 23. When we're talking about the older men, the younger men, the older women, and the younger women, we're to think of them, let me state it again, as family. We are a spiritual family. This is going on in the household of God, okay? We're not related by blood. We're related by the Spirit, okay? So that's the tie that binds us together. Proverbs 30, uh, 23, verse 22 Listen to your father who begot you, and do not despise your mother when she is old. And that's the spirit in which we are to approach people in the congregation, okay? Go back to 1 Timothy. The next category is younger men. We are to treat them as brothers. This is Paul's, again, instruction to Timothy. Younger men are to, be cre are to be corrected in love, just like you would your brother. If you have a brother, I don't have a brother. I've seen a lot of brothers, families that had multiple boys. There can be a frustration between brothers in the family. There can be a rivalry. There can be a jockeying for po po uh, position in the family. There can be competition. But at the end of the day, the brothers always want what's best for their brother. And once they leave the home, they always have their brother's back. It doesn't really matter always what happens in the home. You know what I'm talking about? But outside the home, <laughs> they're back to back, okay? And, 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 and so this, this is how you are to treat your brother with love and respect. I was once, it's hard to believe, I was once a younger man, not so much anymore. And I was, I remember times where I was corrected well, and I remember times when I was not corrected well. And I, and I can tell you that, and I'm speaking to the older men here, you can crush a younger man if you're too hard on him. You can be firm with a young man when it's appropriate, but you have to encourage a young man. If you are just hard on him, it leaves a scar, and he can get discouraged. You can correct him in firmness and love, but there has to be encouragement. Hold your finger there and go to Ephesians chapter 6. This is Paul's instruction in the family. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to look at a couple verses here. Paul tells the fathers, I'm in verse 4, Ephesians 6, 4, do not provoke your children to anger, 
but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. As I've gotten older, I have realized, probably always didn't realize this, we all need to be encouraged. We all need encouragement. We are not designed to live alone. We're not designed to live in a vacuum. We all need to encourage each other. Before we turn, if you're in, in uh, Ephesians 6, then, so, so let's stay here. The next group is the older women. The older women are to be retreated, treated with respect just like the older men. And it says, in, if you're in Ephesians 6, go back to verse 2. Paul quotes the Ten Commandments. He quotes Exodus 20:12, 20, And in verse 2, Paul writes, honor your father and your mother. We're now to the, to the older women that we are to treat like mothers. This is the first commandment with a promise, Paul writes, verse 3, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. While we're here, go back to verse 1. All this, all this interrelated between older men, older women, younger men, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Again, if Timothy's younger, he's, he's approaching possibly in Ephesus, older men for correction, older women for correction, and this is how, this is the tone he is to take with them. Go back to 1 Timothy. Chapter 5. Older women, even in correction, are to be treated with the respect and care that you would give your mother. Your mother is the one who brought you into this world. The, your mother is the one that nurtured you as a child when you could not nurture yourself. There should be affection and a place of reverence for your mother's and that is how we are to treat older women in the congregation. And this last group that Paul gets to in verse 2 is younger women. Younger women are to be approached as sisters with the protection that you give a sister. And, and now Paul breaks his pattern and he adds a phrase concerning the younger women. He says, in all purity, meaning with sinlessness, without sin. This is how the church is to treat younger women, in all purity. This is why fathers are protective of their daughters. Men know what men are like, and they don't necessarily want that for their daughters. So there is this protection that a father gives for his daughter. And so... When we look at this, Paul sets, sets the categories, all of us, he's basically, he's, he's drawn a circle around the entire church. You're either an older man or you're a younger man, or you're an older woman, or you're a younger woman. I, I, will, I will say this about that all purity without sin. Um, Matt, Kent, and I all have daughters. And if you were a man in this congregation, I, we, we, we are blessed to have all four of these categories in this church. Men, treat the younger women as your sister in all purity. If you do not, it will not go well for you. This, I mean, Paul's making a special note. This is how the young women are to be treated, okay? This is how we are to interact with each other. We are together in Christ. Second section, starting in verse 3, it's Christian responsibility. It's Christian responsibility and Christian provision. He writes in verse 3, honor, revere, honor widows who are widows indeed. Now, here's something that we need to spend a little bit more time on. This word that is translated widow 
really has a broader context than what we normally think of the word widow when we think of widow. When, I, when somebody says to me that they're a widow, that's okay, you were married, your husband died, and now you are alone, okay? That's what we think of as a widow. This, this definition really has, it, it, it goes beyond that, and the, and the real meaning here, it's the idea of a woman who has been bereft, who has been robbed, or she's been depleted of her resources. It, it is pictured in the definition of this, wor- this word as a city that's been under siege, and it's been stripped of all of its resources. It has nothing. It's been stripped bare, okay? So that word that is describing a, a widow here re- really has the idea beyond just of you had a husband that dies. It, it, it represents that woman whose husband has died. It represents the woman who has been deserted by her husband. Maybe he's not dead. And, and it even goes as far to say the divorced woman that does not have the means to support herself. So it is really looking at a woman that doesn't have the means, an older woman that does not have the means to support herself. It, in the time that this was written, women didn't work outside the home. And by and large, they did not have the ability to support themselves economically. A woman would raise up, be brought up, born into a family, and her protector was her father. Her provider was her father, and then she would get married, and that responsibility for protection and provision would be transferred to her husband. That, that was the culture of the day, okay? And so, whether your husband died, whether your husband deserted you, whether your husband divorced you, you were then left in an economic situation often where you did not have the means to support yourself. So, when, when Paul writes these words, honor widows who are widows indeed, he's casting a little bit larger net than what we may initially think of when we use the term widow, okay? Um, Things have changed today in many cases, but it's not always for the the better. Um, I'm going to read this. You can write it down. James 1, 27. Starts off, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this. And then you're you're sort of, you you could fill in the blank, and you go, okay, I don't know exactly where he's going with this, but, but there's a lot of different ways he could go with this. And what is, he, what, what is inspired to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world? The Lord protects those who cannot protect him, themselves. The Lord is sovereign. He knows all the details of life. He protects those who can't protect themselves, and he often uses others like you and I in the aiding of that protection, that provision. Hold your finger there. Go back to 1 Kings. 1 Kings 17. Elijah. This is a beautiful example, picture of the Lord providing. 1 Kings 17. In the first seven verses, Elijah has predicted a a drought. The ravens are feeding him bread and meat, verse 6. And then we get to verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there, and behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please give me a little water in a jar that I may drink. As she was going 
to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in a bowl and a little oil in, a, in, a, in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in, pre- prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. We're at the end. We're, we're going to make something. <laughs> That's all I've got. I can't even make you a cake, and we are going to die because we have nothing. Drought in the land. Verse 13, then Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me, and afterwards you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her, she and he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted nor did the jar of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. The Lord again protects those who cannot protect themselves. Go forward to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. The Lord Jesus Christ, knowing God's word, knowing what the family is called to do, knowing the commandments to honor your mother and your father, he gets after the Pharisees and the scribes. I'm in Luke 20, verses 46 and 47. Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and respect and love respectful greetings in the marketplace, and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. And here's here's the accusation, the true accusation, who devour widows' homes and for the appearance sake offer long prayers, these will receive greater condemnation. These people, these, these men who are the religious leaders, the lawyers, of Israel were feeding upon those that they could feed upon, and it was the widows. They were taking advantage of them, and the Lord was condemning them because this was their only means to support, and yet these who were to to represent ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ in Israel's redemptive economy, they're preying on the weak. You don't have to turn there. It's Exodus 20. Exodus 22, verses 22 through 24. You shall not afflict any widow or orphan if you afflict him at all. And if he does cry out to me, I will surely hear his cry. And my anger will be kindled and I will kill you with the sword and your wives will become widows and your children fatherless. The Lord is serious about this. We are not to prey upon those that cannot defend themselves. We are to do the opposite. We are to provide for them. And so, Paul says that in, in the context of this, go back to 1 Timothy, the widows, the older women in need are lacking. They are to be honored if they are truly widows in need. Verse 4, 1 Timothy 5, verse 4. Who's responsible? Whose responsibility is this? Verse 4 tells us that the primary responsibility for widows and their need is their own family. That's first. Read verse 4. But if any widow has 
children or grandchildren. They must first learn to practice piety. The ESV says godliness in regard to their own family, their own household, to make some return. In other words, to give back what is due to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. The responsibility of widows, those who do not have the means to support themselves, is first to the family and not the church. That is the primary mechanism. That is what the Lord is commanding you and me to do. The child is to look after his mother, her mother, to provide for her to make provision. This is the return that was due. Again, let, let me hearken back to what your mother did for you. There are so many babies in this congregation, and it's a blessing. But it's interesting when we talk to people that are, have their first child how are you doing? I'm tired. Why are you tired? Well, I'm feeding the baby every three hours. I'm never getting any sleep. Do you know how many diapers you go through? There is, to have a child, you're all in 24 hours a day. And you're all in for probably the first 25 years of their lives. Or maybe beyond. Does it ever end? No. Um, That is what mothers do for their children. And so when they are widowed for all the provision, all the nurturing, all the love, all the care that they've given, the return is when they can't supply for themselves, that's the family's job. That's not only the children's job, it may be the grandchildren's job. That's how this works in the family of God amongst believers. Go to Matthew 15. Again, the Lord gets after the religious leaders. Matthew 15, starting in verse 1. Then some of the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. This has nothing to do with eating with clean hands. This was a ceremony. This was a religious ceremony that to keep yourself pure, they used to believe that through your dirty hands, the devil would enter your body Whatever, okay? Verse 3, let me get to the point. And he, the Lord Jesus Christ, answered them, the scribes and the Pharisees, why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God says, honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. This is a quote from Exodus 21, 17. But you say what you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever I ha- have that would help you has been given to God. He is not to honor his father and mother. That's what they said. And Jesus says, and by this, you, inv- you invalidate the word of God for the sake of your tradition. The Lord Jesus Christ is going, You're, you are not doing what the Lord has commanded. The Lord has commanded that you take care of your parents when they are older because they took care of you. You are to honor and to respect them. These are, again, women who cannot provide for their fam- for themselves. It's the responsibility of the families first, straight from the Lord. This is what believers are to do. This is our responsibility. Verse 5, now she who is a widow indeed and who has been left alone, meaning she has no one to provide for her, has her hope, her trust, fixed on her, tr- her, her, has fixed her hope, trust on God, 
and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. Again, at that time, a widow could not scratch out a resume and go get a job. Jobs were not available for women. And so once they were in this position, it was an economic burden from that time on. Go back to Luke chapter 2, Luke's gospel. We see examples of this in the word, in God's word. Luke chapter, if I can find Luke, Luke chapter 2. Jesus is being brought to the temple. Verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, Luke 2, 36. There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84. So she was married. She was married for seven years. The text implies that her husband died. She's now, she was probably in her 20s when this happened. Now she's 84, and it says, if you continue to read, she never left the temple serving night and day with fasting and prayers. She'd been a widow for at least 50 years. She had her hope set upon the Lord. This pictures a godly woman who trusts in the Lord, who is helping in the worship of God. She's doing all she can do. And this is the woman that is to be provided for. This is the widow that the family first is to provide for. Go forward in Luke's gospel to chapter 21. Think about this. The Lord Jesus Christ is on the cross, and he is about to give up his spirit. Okay? His earthly father, Joseph, is long gone. His mother, Mary, is still alive. And what does he do on the cross? He looks at John and looks at Mary and says, Mary, Behold your son. John, she's your responsibility. He is giving his life up, about to suffer the wrath of God for the sins of his people, and his mother is on his mind, and provision for his widow mother mother comes to his mind, and he makes provision for her through his disciple, John. Okay? Luke chapter 21, Jesus, he's looking, they're looking at the temple, and it says in verse 1, Luke, Luke 21, 1, and he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins, and he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them, for they all out of their surplus put into the offering, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. That's the plight of the of the widow. And so that that this is the godly widow. Okay? Verse six. He paints a different picture. He pick, paints a picture of a contrast to the godly widow. This is not the one who is a widow indeed. Verse 6, but she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. The widow who gives herself to the pleasure of the world, to live in luxury, to live a sensual life, she's not the one that Paul is instructing Timothy that the family is to support. She has gone astray, okay? And, and the words that he's using here, she's breathing, she's alive, 
She's alive physically, but she's dead in the fact that she is spiritually dead. She's not living for God. She's living for herself. She's not a believer. She's not in the household of God. And so she is, she, she is alive, but she's, the de- she's a dead man walking. And this is one of the most, this is the most dangerous position you can be in. She was seeking pleasure and luxury. And let me tell you, that can be fun, but it's fleeting. It lasts for a moment. Have you, have you ever thought about the psychology of a vacation? You, we've, we've been fortunate to go on some vacations this year. You save your money. You're going to spend a bunch of money. You go somewhere. You have to buy everything. And you're just like, I'm going on vacation. I'm going on vacation. And it's for this short period of time. And, and the first day of the vacation, the whole vacation's in front of you. By the middle of the vacation, you're like, I've only got a couple days. At the end of the vacation, it's over. You come back to work, and it's a distant memory. That's living for the pleasures of this world. It doesn't last. It's not eternal. It's ethereal. You can't bottle it. You can't keep it. And so that's the woman. Verse 7, Paul says to Timothy, Describe these things. Tell, command these things, as the ESV puts it, so that they may be above reproach, meaning that so no one can make a claim against those in the church that they did not care for their own. This was such an important ministry. This is a, such an important responsibility of the church that this was the first ministry that was established in the church that did not have to do with the teaching and the preaching of God's Word. Go to Acts chapter 6. This is how important this is. We are to do this at Trinity Bible Church of Dallas. This, led, th- this need led to the appointment of deacons. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now at that time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews. So these would have been the 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 believing people that spoke Greek, these were out living outside. They weren't, they weren't living in Israel. They were part of the, probably the diaspora. And so there's groups of different cultures, but they're all believers. There were the Hellenistic Jews, and then there were the native Hebrew Jews. And amongst them, there are, there are widows, and here's the, the complaint, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Again, they couldn't provide for themselves. They were providing for these widows because they had no economic means. There were some in different cultures, but they're all believers. The Jew and the Greek are united in the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. So this controversy breaks up. There's a complaint. Verse 2, so the 12, the apostles, summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Here's where the deacons come in. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we can put in charge of this task, but we will denote our, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. It was so important that they, impor- that they appointed men to carry out this, this deed, to provide for those that can not provide for themselves. Again, what is pure and undefiled religion? It's taking care of the orphans and the widows. Verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, meaning a relative in the church, that's the context, 
But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Ministry starts at home. That is your primary ministry. That is my primary ministry. That is what a believer is to do. If we don't practice what we preach in our own home, then you invalidate what you preach outside the home. If, if, if you want to know what a man is really like, ask his wife what type of man he is in the home. Ministry starts in the home. If a man can't lead in the home, how is he going to lead outside of the home? Ministry all starts in the home. Again, the commandment is, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged. We have two daughters, and when you have daughters, when you have children, you do everything you can for them. You try to bring them up in the way of the Lord. You give them the best education that you can afford. You send them to college. You, they play piano. They swim. They do whatever. And as, as a parent with two children, looking at both these children, they're, they're very different. But you're encouraging both of them. It's not a, you, you love both of them. But as you get older, your perspective starts to change, and I have to admit this. I look at my daughters, and I think, well, let me, let me side note, I'm at the weak end of the gene pool. I'm a fragile little buttercup. I get sick, okay? And I look at my daughters sometimes wondering, when I get old and you put me in the nursing, nursing home, which one of you is going to take care of me? Who's going to make sure that somebody doesn't steal my jello? <laughs> but that's the duty in that, in, in that joke. That's the duty of, of believers to, to provide for their own family. That's what we're called to do. Ministry, the gospel, everything, ministry starts at home. And when the family fails, as it has failed in society, this is another consequence. This is another chicken that comes home to roost because when you have failure in the family and the family disintegrates, then you have old people that can't take care of themselves because their family isn't there to take care of them. Well, we're going to get back into this, Lord willing, next week. Let me close this with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be mindful of how we are related to each other in your body, that we are fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I, I, I pray that we would live as if you are the most important and we are not. We are not. I pray, Lord, that we would view ourselves for what we really are, that at best we're bond servants and we're fellow bond servants. Lord, I, I, I appeal to myself and to all for unity. And, and, and Lord, these, these instructions of how we should act in the home, I pray, Lord, that it would sink into our minds and our hearts and we would see our responsibility, what you've called us to do according to your word, that we would honor our parents, our mothers and our fathers, that we would honor our brothers and our sisters. Lord, I know this. We should treat the other as, as well as we can because you have treated us beyond what we deserve. Bless us this week. Bless Ken as he preaches this next hour. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.